everybody. Third time is the charm. We think we've got everything worked out. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, give it over to Professor Walls. Keep our fingers crossed that we've got this and take it away, Professor Walls. Okay, thank you. Hopefully third time's a charm, everybody. Apologize for that. Don't know what's going on, but I'm here. I teach on Fort Hood, uh, U.S. history, Western civilization. So come on over and see us if you can. And my job today is to talk a little bit about the contributions that people of Asian or Pacific Island descent have made to American history. So we're just going to forget about me and just get right into it and do the whole thing. So I have a PowerPoint I sent over to our fearless librarian here. So are we good to go? Is it up? About uh, to be up? Yes, we're going to get it. All right. So. What we're going to do is talk about, there it is. We're going to talk about some of the contributions that folks have made from, you know, Asia or the Pacific. And you got to think about what such a large topic, if you want to back up one, what such a large topic this is and, and what such a large area this is to encompass. So we're going to have, you know, a huge choice of people. Now, I grew up on the West Coast. I grew up with you know, people from everywhere. And of course, if you live in, in the Fort Hood region of Killeen, Texas, or Harker Heights, I mean, you've grown up with people who are from everywhere too. So in, in a sense, it's really, really similar for me. But I grew up in California. My father spent time in Japan while he was in the army in the early 60s. And we had a Japanese uh, exchange student when I was a kid named Saichi. Um, very, very multicultural kind of an area. And, uh, but I moved to Texas in 99 and things were a lot different in East Texas, but now we live in central Texas and again, very, very multicultural. So, um, my experiences out West have helped translate into things that I'm doing here. As I said, I teach us history, Western civilization. It'd be nice to teach Eastern civilization, but not really within the junior college purview, I suppose. But um, over the years, migrated here, and again, you look around, you see all all sorts of people from all sorts of places because of the connection we have to the U.S. Army here at Fort Hood. So we have students that are literally from the entire world. They're not uh, they're not necessarily even born in the United States. They've married into or been born elsewhere and are related to soldiers and. So we see them in class and it's great, but if you would turn to the next slide. There's a couple of sort of really big events. I think that most people know, or most people know about. Um, and that is the Chinese railroad workers. And the Japanese internment camps and the whole situation with Japan and world war two. And I think. Most people are probably familiar, at least enough with those things. If you go back to the mid 1800s and the gold rush, for example, 1849 golds discovered and, and huge numbers, hundreds of thousands of people make it to California over the next couple of years. And many of them are from Asia and, and in particular from China. Um, it was actually almost easier to get here from China than it would have been to get here, get to California anyway from the east coast which brings you to the railroads why were so many chinese people brought here to work on the railroads it's because it was too hard to get all the people who are already in boston and you know the whole east coast region which is where most of our population was at the time all the way over to california to work on the railroad so naturally all these folks from asia I mean, again, mainly Chinese, but there were people coming from all these other countries, Japan, et cetera, and, and we're working on the railroads. And of course, what, what we were doing was connecting California to the rest of the United States. And again, most people are sort of familiar with this one, but we started at the, on the West Coast around Sacramento and San Francisco, and then we started in the East and we met in Utah, in, in Ogden, Utah was one of the places where we connected both together. So from the east, it's all these, uh, um, you know, veterans of the Civil War, freed slaves, all these people uh, that that had come that way. And then from the west, it's all these people from China, and they're going to meet there in Utah in the middle. And so thousands and thousands of 
people of Chinese descent came, uh, and again, and other Asian countries came to work on those as, as cheap labor. That's what it was. And of course, that left a huge legacy, some good, some bad. It's one of the things we'll look at as we go forward in this presentation. It's not all good, unfortunately, but no history is. But you know, this, this legacy, again, I grew up out West, this legacy of the Chinatowns and Korea towns and Japan towns and all these kinds of things. Um, we celebrated Chinese New Year in grade school when I was a kid, as I date myself back in the 70s and 80s. I mean, it was great. And then the other kind of big issue or thing that people always remember, of course, is Japanese internment camps, the situation with World War II, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, their, you know, their involvement in that war with the Germans and the Axis powers. Most people don't realize that before that, Japan was a great trade partner and friend, that Japan was an ally during World War I, and of course, after World War II, there's just a whole lot more going on with the history of the people from the Asia or the Pacific Islands and how they impact America. Now, I think a good question that people would ask is, why don't we talk more about this? And I think there's a couple of answers. And, and one thing is, hey, we're addressing it today. We have this whole month dedicated to Asian Pacific history, which is a good start. These are kinds of things we need to do to make awareness higher. That's what we're doing here at the library. Appreciate the invite to be here to do that. But I think a fairer answer and a more true answer is, well, I mean, frankly, like every other group, that's what we would call a minority group is underrepresented and marginalized in history in the United States and anywhere. Um, the opposite would be true if we are in China, let's say, but they are marginalized and it does have a lot to do with racial issues, with racism, with discrimination. And so up until you know, probably the 1960s, pretty much every group was marginalized out of uh, let's again, let's say American history, since that's really what we're talking about. But this will be true in any country. Uh, and, and Asian immigrants were suffering discrimination on the same level as Africans, Hispanics, the Irish, you know, anybody that had come over after those initial waves uh, early on in the formation of what becomes the United States. And so that, that's a fair answer. Why don't we talk more about some of these people? And that's part of the reason. But in the last you know, several decades, that trend is, is changing. It's improving. I think since the 60s, things have become much more open and much more fair. But another reality of why it's not talked about is more about time. I mean, the reality is I teach U.S. history. We call it 1301 and 1302 here at CTC, and it's American history up to the Civil War is 1301 and American history or United States history from the Civil War to modern times is U.S. history 1302. And we, I teach Western civilization. We have a couple other classes, but, but they're considered lower level classes. They're more like survey classes. They're not classes that are intended to go very deep, nor do we have the time to go very deep into any of those uh, situations. Uh, so here we are thinking about how are we going to cover 400 years of history to get to the American Civil War in 16 weeks or eight weeks, but it's the same class time in 40 contact hours. It's, it's basically impossible. And so we're sprinting through hundreds or thousands of years of history, depending on the class, and there just isn't time to delve deeply into very many events. So we pick the really, really, really big ones and don't even get to do those justice. And that's just me being honest. There's, there isn't time. I, I kind of liken it to when you skip a rock across the pond. If you imagine the rock is you, you know, the, and, and, and the pond is the totality of whatever history you're looking at, the rock only touches the pond a handful of times. And that's basically what we're able to do in a class like U.S. History 1301 or 1302. And so when you think about it, most people in their college history, their college career, are only going to take those basic history classes, the ones you have to take to get to the next level, to get your associate degree or to get your bachelor degree and so on. 
And so they're not going to be taking too many upper level history classes unless history is their major. There are quite a few majors that involve history, but unless unless your major is about history, you're probably not going to do that, at least not very much. The other thing that happens in college is your heroes suddenly become human. And again, some time will have to be spent on those kinds of things. So just again, an easy example, you take the founding fathers, all those guys that were there writing the constitution and they sort of get put on a pedestal, but you know, maybe in high school, but certainly in your college class, you realize they were flawed men, just like I am or you are. And that also then changes some of the emphasis. So really we just don't have time. And so when you get to the higher level though, and of course I'm a history teacher, I would encourage all of you to get out there and take at least one or two higher level history courses if for no other reason just than just to experience some level of depth that we just cannot do. And so we can't do justice to uh, Asian Pacific, you know, history and so on because we just don't have the time. A, a couple examples. I went to, I graduated from Sam Houston State University down in Huntsville uh, with my master's in history. And they, I, I looked yesterday at the classes that they offer, and they offer a class on the Japanese colonial empire. You're never going to get that at a community college. It's just, it's too narrowly focused, but it would be great if you wanted to study that side of things. There's a whole class called China in Revolution, which essentially has to do with uh, mostly the communist revolution that happened in the mid 20th century. There's a class on the Ottoman Empire, which no one's ever even heard of because it's long gone, but they occupy an important place in world history. There's there's a class on U.S. diplomatic history, which I took. There's a class on Latin American history. I also took that. Uh, African-American civil rights. I took one class, by the way, on the German military during World War II. I mean, it's, it can get very specific and that's at a graduate level, of course, which gets even more specific. So that's part of the problem. So if you if you are interested in history and you study history, the thing to do is read some books. I don't recommend watching documentaries, although they have their place. They're too short, kind of like this talk. I can't do justice to all the contributions of Asian Pacific Americans to our history in the little time that we have. But if you study history, you'll get more depth than you can handle at those levels. Believe me, uh, be ready to read a lot if you go to the higher level history classes. But really, you need to read if you want to learn history. Sure, watch documentaries. I watch documentaries. I like documentaries. But really, you want to read books. You need to read more than one book. You need to read, let's say, five or six books or more. So you want to learn about the Civil War? Don't read one, read 10. And then you'll have a decent idea about what's going on with the American Civil War. Uh, you know, not all history books are written the same. Not all of them are well-written. I, I read a book called The Influence of Sea Power Upon History in six, between 1660 and 1783. It's the one of the worst, driest, most boring books I've ever read, but it is a hugely important and influential book on people like Teddy Roosevelt and um, Woodrow Wilson and some of our earlier uh, earlier 20th century leaders. It's a terrible read, though. And then I just recently finished a book called The Raven, which is a biography of Sam Houston, right? the great Texan, and, and that was by Marquise James. And that was a really good read. So you'll, you, it's kind of hit or miss, to be honest. Wikipedia is a great place to start. It's not for academics. You can't use it as a source, people. Sorry for papers, but um, it's a good place to start because it will tell you, hopefully, uh, where the information is coming from, what book, what person said it, that sort of thing, what your sources are. So Wikipedia is a good beginning place. You want to learn about, um, you know, Filipino, early Filipino migration to California. There's plenty of information out there, I'm telling you, available. And if you, if you were to go to Wikipedia and look some of those things up, you would, you would be in a rabbit hole for four days if you want. So what we're going to do is dive deeper into some of the people that contributed to Asian Pacific American history. But first, I want to kind of look at the big picture. So if you go to the next slide, please. First, I want to look at the big picture and there's a map coming up here. And, and I hope you can see this. This is just a map of the Pacific. 
and this area is absolutely enormous. I mean, it includes Australia all the way around the eastern side of Asia, and of course, all the way around the western side of North and South America. People don't often think of the South Americans on the, you know, on the Pacific there in Chile and other places, but they're part of this potentially too. And of course, all sorts of uh, islands, there's thousands of islands in there that most of which we've never heard of, except maybe were World War II buffs. If you remember places like Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima and so on. And of course, very powerful nations like China and Japan are in Asia. And, and so it's just a huge area but if you look at demographics of the United States in 2019, 5.9% of the population identified themselves as being uh, of Asian descent of some sort and 0.2% identified themselves as being either native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander in the United States. And then you have a handful of people that just didn't say, or, you know, claimed to couple, two or three more percent. So not a huge number, Although, again, certain parts of the country, you wouldn't know that. If you go to San Francisco right now, you might think there's a majority of people from Asia, and, and there may be in that one spot. But again, as, as a country, as a whole, it's, it's maybe 6% or so. But the reality is there are huge numbers of people that have flowed into this country that have had major impacts, both culturally, like in very large ways, like the Chinese, the Japanese, and then, of course, individually. So what we're going to do here is just kind of look big picture. So just kind of think about this map. I'm going to read a part of a timeline. I'm not a big fan of timelines, but they do help kind of put things in perspective. And the reality is we've got documented cases of people from of sailors from China and the Philippines as early as 1587 landing in California, documented by Spaniards. You know, they settled that region at least from Europe first. Um, and so it goes way back, right? And, and the first, um, uh, you know, British colony officially in America was in 1620 in Jamestown. And so we, you know, that's just a couple documented cases as early as 1587. No doubt uh, there were quite a few more. And if you want to go back far enough, you know, you might talk about large migration patterns from Asia over, you know, across the land bridge, that sort of thing. But we're not doing that. So we're going to just kind of pick up there. So, um, again, 1587, about the time the British are experimenting with settling in North America, you have Chinese and Filipino sailors reaching California. In 1635, in Jamestown, which again is the first British colony, permanent British colony in America, there is mention in the documentation of an, a person who was East, East Indian in descent. Now, you may recall when Columbus, quote, discovered the Caribbean and discovered America, right? You know, that was an accident. He thought he knew he wasn't in China. He thought he was in India. And so it, it becomes named the West Indies. All the Native American tribal people now in the Western Hemisphere are called Indians, which is the misnomer. But this was a person who was from the country of India in Jamestown. It would have been quite rare and one person only, but as early as 1635, you have someone of East Indian descent contributing to the, the situation there in Jamestown. By the late 1700s, there's Chinese sailors pretty much everywhere. Many, many of them will settle in Hawaii and become permanent residents and marry local people and so on. And, and that's in the late 1700s. Hawaii is still a, an independent kingdom at that point, but there's going to be large numbers of Chinese, Japanese, Filipinos, and others who are going to settle on those islands. Uh, it is about halfway between North America and Asia and China, so... It, Fast forward just a little bit, just again, we're just kind of getting a big picture of how these people influenced American history in various ways. If you took American history in college, you remember the War of 1812, kind of a strange little war that happened that doesn't seem to have a lot of point to it. But during the War of 1812, uh, and again, in the late 1700s, there were 
a number of Filipino people who settled in the Louisiana Bayou area for 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 some reason, and they were sailors. And so um, Andrew Jackson employed and hired and used all these Filipino smugglers living in the region in the war against the British. Remember, there was a large, large battle fought in New Orleans in 1815. That was a huge victory for Jackson. And a number of Filipino people were involved in that conflict. In the Civil War, the American Civil War, about 70 Chinese and Filipino men enlisted in the Union Army and Navy. And some lesser number than that also served in the Confederate military. So uh, even as far back as 1865, we have individuals who are of Asian Pacific descent serving in various roles in U.S. military actions. Uh, we noted the, the, the Transcontinental Railroad, probably the most important railroad in American history and the influence that these thousands and thousands of Chinese workers had. Now, often what happens is the workers come over to work and of course they stay and that'll often generate a lot of difficulty as we'll see, but it'll be their children who are born here or were very young when they came, but often will be the ones who are able to make real headway and go to school and kind of do well, as we'll see. So that that railroad is built in the 1860s and 70s, and then other railroads are built after that. And then in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act is passed, which actually forbids any more immigration of Chinese laborers. People were, uh, they didn't like them. They were really different, you know, again, racism, all that stuff kind of rears its head. They were taking jobs. It's all the usual kind of answers people give to do those sorts of things. But in 1882, that was passed. And so Chinese immigration, uh, especially for just regular laborers, almost slows to a trickle. Um, we'll have similar things with Japan and some of the other countries. But in 1898, Hawaii becomes a, a U.S. territory. And most of the inhabitants of Hawaii, almost all of them, probably well over 90% are native Hawaiians, Chinese, Japanese, or Filipinos. And all of those people will become U.S. citizens. And in that same year, the Philippines comes under protection of the United States, becomes a territory um, as a result of the Spanish-American War. And all those inhabitants become U.S. nationals, which is slightly different than a U.S. citizen. And I don't know why uh, there was a difference in the Philippines and Hawaii, but again, huge numbers of people of Asian descent, Pacific Island descent becoming U.S. nationals. Now, in 1924, the Immigration Act passed uh, not long after World War I, um, basically stopped almost all immigration to the United States, but in particular from Asia. And again, they focus on regular laborers. If you were college educated or skilled in some way, then you could still go through the normal channels and get in. But it, it basically, we basically brought almost all immigration down to almost zero during the 1920s and 30s. Of course, we go into the Great Depression. And of course, in World War II, the Philippines is controlled by the United States. It's a U.S. territory, and that will be attacked and invaded by Japan and you know, most of the Filipino people will fight. And of course, as a result of World War II, we mentioned earlier the concentration, or not the concentration camps, excuse me, that is a terrible way to put it. It was not concentration camp. They were internment camps. Concentration camps were in Germany where they were murdering Jews. This did not happen in the United States. But Japanese people were put in these camps. Uh, there was this great fear, unfounded by the way, but a fear that if Japan attacked mainland of the United States, that all these Japanese people would support Japan when the reality was the opposite. And it's during that generation that a group of people, Japanese Americans called the Nisei, who, whose families oftentimes were being put into these camps, they fought in the war, uh, usually in Europe. We formed something called the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, for example, and they fought in Europe for the most part, they are and they remain the highest decorated unit of its size in American history, these Japanese American guys. And some women, uh, we had also 
plenty of Japanese Americans serving in the in the sort of secret service or intelligence branches during the war as well, helping out with the situation in Japan. Uh, this is the most decorated unit of its size in American history. So, you know, even though there were some horrible things happening, there were others who were stepping up and again, had great influence. 1948, we're gonna see two Japanese American Olympians, Vicky Drobs and Sammy Lee become the first Asian Americans to win gold medals in the Olympics for the United States. They were both divers. And, and that's, you know, we're gonna start breaking the color barrier. We always talk in terms of black and white about the color barrier, but the reality is the color barrier is anyone who's not white who is breaking these barriers. And we're gonna see a lot of Asian descended people are gonna be the first ones to break some of these barriers. Well, of course, in 1950, we get into the Korean War. Um, and in 1952, something called the Walter McCarran Act actually nullifies all of the previous anti-Asian laws, which is good. So they wiped all that out. Immigrations opened back up. All the, you know, things about voting and you know, intermarrying. There's all these crazy rules that were in place that were very, very uh, wrong are removed. 1964, excuse me, 1962, a young man named Roman Gabriel will be drafted by the Rams of the National Football League. He is part Filipino, so he becomes the first Asian descended starting quarterback in the NFL, and he still holds Rams records for wins and touchdown passes, which is kind of hard to believe. I think he played 11 years or so with the Rams and he was voted the league's most valuable player in 1969. So you talk about breaking some barriers. We'll talk about some other sports figures later. Uh, 1964 really begins serious U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War, which goes for the next uh, you know, 10 or so years. Uh, then we get some more modern things and we'll wrap up this timeline because I know timelines are kind of boring, but I wanted to just give you a kind of big picture view of a lot of the different things that are happening. But in 1971, a gentleman named Norman Mineta was elected mayor of San Jose, California, which is uh, kind of my hometown. And believe me, his name is plastered everywhere. The airport's named after him. Uh, well, he becomes the first Asian American, he's Japanese descended, mayor of a major US city. There were other uh, gentlemen from Asian countries you know, in small cities, but San Jose is a huge metro area. Uh, Mineta later becomes the first Asian American appointed to a cabinet level post. In 2000, President Clinton made him the Commerce Secretary. And then in 2001, President George W. Bush appointed him as the Transportation Secretary. So again, kind of big steps there. 1988, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was passed and signed by President Reagan, and, and he apologized. He issued an apology on behalf of the United States and the government to all of the Japanese people that were affected and impacted and frankly, illegally uh, incarcerated during World War II. And, and some of them were given some kind of uh, money or something because they, a lot of them lost property and so on. So again, big steps being taken toward normalizing and equalizing the situation uh, with these folks. And of course, this past year, or this this past, this year, Kamala Harris uh, is not only the first female vice president ever, she's also of Indian descent, that is from Asia, the in country of India. She's also partly of Indian descent, of course, partly of African descent as well. So she she checks the boxes of a lot of firsts, and that's just some of the highlights and frankly, some of the lowlights of uh, Asian Pacific history in the United States. But now I wanna talk about some people. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, we're gonna talk about five specific individuals because I think it's important to put names to faces. Again, the problem with timelines is that there's very few names and faces and it's hard to really get into that. What timelines do is they help you see where things fit. 
but they're really boring to teach and talk about. So let's let's talk about some people. This guy is Larry Itlong, born in 1913. He passed away in 1977. Uh, he was afflicted with ALS. But what I want to do is just kind of think about these individuals and the contributions that they made because they're huge. And yet, you know, it's the problem I addressed earlier. They kind of get marginalized and and in classes where they might come up there's so much other stuff going on again in our community colleges that oftentimes these types of individuals get overlooked so larry itlong is filipino and he and his family immigrated to the united states in 1929 and he was about 14 at the time and they began working as uh, you know farm laborers agriculture which most people did in california i mean california for all of its you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco, et cetera, is still the largest producing agricultural state in the United States. Uh, sometimes that's hard to believe. And so even now, many people are employed that way. And back then it was almost entirely agriculture. And there were, again, huge amounts of people coming from the Philippines in the 20s and 30s, you know, after World War I, once some of that immigration has opened up. Of course, remember the Philippines are a territory of the United States. And so there are really large numbers of Filipinos coming to California to work agriculture. And so he did. And so in 1929, they come, he's working. Next year in 1930, he joins his first strike to better the situation of the farm workers. And that's gonna be kind of his signature. And he worked all over the, the West Coast, Alaska, uh, actually, he lost some fingers working in a cannery in Alaska, so they called him Seven Fingers, kind of his nickname. He worked in Washington State, Montana, South Dakota, but mostly in California. And as a lot of these people did during the war, they served in the U.S. military. He served aboard an Army transport ship for two years or so during the war. While in Alaska, he helped found the Alaska Cannery Workers Union. And later in California, he participated in the asparagus strike. You've heard of the great asparagus strike, I'm sure, in 1948. Actually, no one has, so don't feel bad if you haven't. But that was actually the first strike of its kind after World War II. Remember, no one's going on strike during the war and immediately after the war because two things. They hadn't worked in 10 years because of the Great Depression. And the second thing is they all wanted to win the war. And so everyone worked. Um, I can remember both of my grandfathers telling me that they would have worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week if they could have physically done that during the war because of those two things. They had been in really bad times during the Great Depression. And then in during the war, they had more work than they could possibly do. And so it takes a couple of years for things to start to normalize again after a war, especially one like World War II. And so in 1948, you have the strike. Um, in 1956, he goes on to be one of the founders of the Filipino Farm Labor Union in Stockton, which was becomes his hometown. And by 1965, he's heading up the uh, AFL-CIO, which is a big union conglomerate. Uh, the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, and they went on strike against grape growers. Now, we do often talk about, at least in my class, the grape strikes in California in the 1960s, uh, and this is one of them. There are a couple, and he's a big part of that reason why it happened. And what they were doing was the thing that unions always do when they go on strike. They want better pay, better working conditions, and better hours, and they do get a little bit better pay in that particular one, but it's the next great strike, which kind of captures America's attention. And, and unfortunately for Larry Itlong, he kind of gets pushed off to the side a little bit. And so he's just not talked about. So that same year, there'll be a great strike. And this is the one that Cesar Chavez joins with large contingents of Mexican workers. And the, there's this you know, we have the Filipino community, we have this Mexican community, all these farm workers, they all compete with each other for the same jobs, but at the same time, they're all undergoing the same challenges of poor pay and poor conditions and all those things. So in 1965, they got together and 
this strike lasts about five years and they're asking Americans to boycott grapes and it makes national news and it's on the front page of newspapers. And again, Larry Itlong's right in the middle of that. Only everyone only talks about Cesar Chavez. He kind of became the face. And it's kind of like with others that happens. It's hard to, you know, talk about everyone, as I said at the beginning. So Cesar Chavez becomes the face of migrant worker strikes and that, even though there were hundreds of other people who were also involved in that. And in the same way that Martin Luther King became the face of the civil rights movement, even though there were hundreds of other individuals who were working with him. And of course, he was killed. And so he doesn't have that many years involved. Or Susan B. Anthony, when we're talking about women's rights, again, there were hundreds of other women and men who were involved in that, but Susan B. Anthony is the one we're going to remember. So Itlong's contributions, while great, get lost in the shuffle. So part of that's just, you know, the amount of information and who kind of shows up on television. And part of that maybe has to do with, with the, the Filipino people and, and so on being marginalized at that time. All right, the next slide, please. So another individual that we want to think about is named Patsy Mink. She recently passed, well, I guess not recently now, but she lived from 1927 to 2002. She was born and raised in Hawaii, third generation Japanese American. And she attended the University of Nebraska of all places. It seems like a long trip to go from Hawaii to Nebraska, but she wanted to pursue law and of course, while she was in Nebraska, I think you could imagine there probably weren't that many people of Asian descent in Nebraska. And she experienced segregation and discrimination, and she worked very hard while in school there to help deal with that and was successful. Ultimately, she graduates from law school from the University of Chicago in 1951 and moved back to Hawaii. The problem she runs into in Hawaii is again, one of genderism and racism. So she was not allowed to take the bar exam in Hawaii because of some issue with her status. Well, she fought that and she won and she was able to take and of course pass the bar. She started her own practice because no one would hire a female Asian who had children to be a lawyer. Turned out she was a pretty good lawyer. Uh, in 1956, she runs for the Hawaii Territorial House of Representatives. Keep in mind, Hawaii at this point is not a state. That doesn't happen until August of 1959. So she's in the territorial legislature who governed the territory. And she won a seat there. She is the first Japanese American woman to sit in the territorial House of Representatives or any House of Representatives in Hawaii. In 1958, she wins a Senate seat. She's the first woman to serve in the Territorial Senate of Hawaii. And of course, a year later, Hawaii becomes a state. In 1964, she serves in the United States House of Representatives from Hawaii, becoming, you guessed it, the first Asian American woman and the first woman of color to be elected to Congress ever. And the first woman from Hawaii. So remember, the, when we say woman of color, we're meaning a woman who is not white. And so she is the first woman of color to be elected to Congress, which is pretty amazing. And she served 12 terms, which is 24 years in Congress from Hawaii. And, you know, people go, wow, that's great. I mean, she's, she's certainly up there. I don't Remember if Dr. Temple talked about her, I mean, she has thousands of people to choose from just like I do when she talked about Women's History Month a few weeks ago. But Patsy Mink certainly could be on that list. Now, some of the important bills that she sponsored or worked on were the Early Childhood Education Act, of course, the Freedom of Information Act, which is supposed to, you know, give us all the details about the Kennedy assassination and so on. Yeah, right. But she co-authored the Title IX Amendment of Higher Education Act, which is the Title IX is the part that prohibits sex-based discrimination in schools and sports and all those kind of things. So it's a big, big deal. And so she is very instrumental in those kinds of causes, as you would imagine, have being someone who fought that sort of thing for her entire life. All right, let's move on to the next person. 
So we go from someone who was very important in uh, the labor movement, in Larry Itlong, to Patsy Mink, who's very important in politics, not only just from a standpoint of being in politics as a Japanese American woman and all the the glass ceilings she blew up to get there, but in terms of the work she did. Now we turn to Wataru Misaka, uh, who just passed away in 2019, who is a Japanese American basketball player. Okay, so you say, well, that doesn't seem like as big of a deal or as big of an accomplishment, but it really is. Now, Wataru was born in Ogden, Utah, ironically, the place where the Transcontinental Railroad came together, but he was born there, dealt with segregation his whole life, discrimination again, not a ton of Asian people in Utah at that time uh, in the you know early 20th century, but he still managed to play sports and excel at them. Now, Wataru Masaka is five foot seven, which me being six foot three seems pretty short, and it is shorter than the average uh, you know, American, uh, but not that much for Japanese. But he led his high school basketball team to two state championships. He led his junior college to two championships and was named Junior College Athlete of the Year in 1943. The next year, he, had he attended the University of Utah, and he led them to an NCAA title. And then he took a couple of years off for the Army during World War II, and he served as a staff sergeant. He was part of the occupation forces in Japan. Of course, you know, they surrendered in the summer of 1945, of course. Well, he comes back, and he goes back to Utah, University of Utah, and they won another NCAA title in 1946 and 47. So again, very prolific ball player for someone who seems relatively short to play that position, that game. And, but in 1947, kind of his bigger accomplishment, I guess when you wrap it all together, he was drafted by the New York Knicks, then of the Basketball Association of America, but today is known as the National Basketball Association. And so Wataru Misaka is the not only the first Asian uh, player, Asian American player, but he's the first person of color to break the the NBA barrier, which seems strange looking back on it now. And so he broke the bat the professional basketball wall barrier the same year that Jackie Robinson broke the baseball color barrier. Which again that's 1947. That's pretty amazing. Who gets all the credit? And I'm not saying, you know, wrongly, Jackie Robinson has an amazing professional career in baseball that spanned a couple of decades. While Taru Masaka only played three games or so for the Knicks. But nevertheless, it's a pretty important contribution that gets overlooked. He was invited to join the Harlem Globetrotters, of all things. He, he declined and went on to become an engineer and Again, just passed away two years ago. He was inducted into the Utah Sports Hall of Fame, and a documentary was produced about him and his basketball exploits, breaking the color barrier back in 1947 and all that. That was produced in 2008. So, you know, you think, well, a sports guy, maybe that's not as big of a deal, but it really is. We're talking about people who move the needle, people who break barriers, who break these walls down and Masaka is as important as Ms. Mrs. Mink or any other people that we're going to talk about. All right, let's next slide, please. Let's talk about another lady. Uh, Chin Chung Wu is known as the first lady of physics, sometimes Madam Wu, and she's often compared to Madam Curie. She lived from 1912 to 1997, and you can see her picture here and you can see her standing with all these other guys again everybody knows some of the big physicians and einstein's not in that picture but you know the guys that that worked on some of the atomic uh you know manhattan project and so on well well miss wu mrs wu is right in the mix in fact she's maybe one of the better scientists that actually worked there now naturally being a female and being uh, Asian is going to mean that she's going to have to fight a lot of discrimination and so on. Well, she was born in a little fishing village in China back in 1912. And her father actually was a teacher and he founded a school and he insisted that she go because he believed, unlike most other people, 
especially in China, that women should be educated too. And so she did get educated. She was extremely smart. She graduated at the top of her class in 1934 from the National Central University of Nanking. So that's impressive. She then moves to the United States and earns her PhD in physics from the University of California at Berkeley, kind of my old stomping grounds, which again is kind of known as a physics engineering school. And while she was in school, mind you, not after, not as a later adult, while she was a student there, she earned a Nobel Prize. She won a Nobel Prize in physics because she invented the cyclotron particle accelerator, which is gonna be really important toward the development of things like nuclear energy, nuclear weapons, and all of that sort of stuff. She is the first woman who was hired by the physics department at Princeton. Imagine that. And in 1944, she was recruited for the Manhattan Project. So she worked on things like improving the Geiger counter machines because, you know, when you're working with atomics, radiation, super important. So her, one of her jobs of many was to make them better and more accurate and more efficient. And she certainly succeeded. She worked on things like enriching uranium, which again is kind of fundamental and foundational to creating nuclear energy, whether you're using it for energy or for weapons. So she's part of that. Now we never mention her, or, you know, we're only gonna mention the big people of the Manhattan Project and so on, but there she was right in the middle of it. And you can see that, that picture of her, I hope. She's known in physics circles anyway, at, for something called the Wu experiment, which was a test where they tested beta decay and the theory of the con of conservation parity, which I don't know what any of that means because I'm a history professor and not a physics person, but it was really important. And she almost won a Nobel prize for that. Probably should have by all the accounts that I've read about her, but again, others kind of took precedence in that. So. You know, here she is kind of breaking down all these barriers, a woman, physics, she's Chinese. Um, it makes sense that she would be important in the movement as well. You know, and, and you should realize that just because a woman or a person of Asian descent or African descent or whatever the case is, is in one of these positions that they're necessarily gonna be super militant about things, they aren't all. Many of them just go about their business and do their jobs and they do it well and they prove their value and they break these stereotypes. And that's a lot of what Chen Chung Wu did, but she was an advocate of women in STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, math, all of that. She spoke at a symposium. Uh, you'll like this quote, uh, you know, here she is a woman, first woman hired by Princeton, working on the Manhattan Project, has a Nobel Peace Prize, she's not getting paid the same as her male counterparts who are doing exactly the same stuff that she did. And in 1964, she's speaking in, at MIT. She said, I wonder whether the tiny atoms and nuclei or the mathematical symbols or the DNA molecules have any preference for either masculine or feminine treatment. And, you know, it wasn't long after that, that she does get full pay and they recognize that kind of thing. But it, I mean, it takes till the 60s or 70s for that sort of thing to happen. She is the first president, elected president of the American Physical Society, the first woman to receive an honorary doctorate from Princeton. She even has an asteroid named after her in 1990. Asteroid 2752 was named for her in, in honor of the accomplishments that she did. So you can see that you know, you don't have to be Susan B. Anthony, whose basically entire life was dedicated toward women's rights, and, and she, it needed to be, of course, uh, to be really, really important to these movements. All right, next slide. Last person we're going to talk about in particular is Steve Chin. So I'm sure everyone watching this has heard of YouTube. Most of you probably will watch this on YouTube, maybe Facebook, and they're, of course, related. But Steve, Steve Chin, born in 1978, man, he's younger than I am. Steve Chin is one of the, of course, co-founders of YouTube, among other things. Now, Steve Chin's born in Taiwan, so I don't know how many realize the relationship that Taiwan bears. Taiwan 
depends on who you ask. If you ask China, China will say Taiwan belongs to China. If you ask Taiwan, they'll say, no, they're an independent nation. If you ask the United States, we'll say, no, they're an independent nation. Um, kind of what happens is during the communist revolution after World War II, the not communists kind of left and kind of huddled in Taiwan. And, and you know, given the time period, we backed them rather than communist China. But in any case, they moved to Illinois in 1993. He attends the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy for high school, goes to the University of Illinois in Champaign and gets a degree in computer science. He worked for PayPal. I mean, everybody uses PayPal, right? He worked for Facebook for a while, met a lot of people. And that's where he met these two places where he met his friends and they started YouTube. And that's kind of a weird story. And, and I love these stories. You hear them all the time. Apparently in 2004, which is about the time they did this, or at least where the ideas came from, uh, in 2004, there were two really, really big public events that were publicized very, very heavily on television and on this kind of new internet thing that was going on back then. One of them was the tsunami that raged through many parts of Asia. It decimated regions of Asia, it killed a lot of people. And the other was kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum, the so-called wardrobe malfunction that happened to Janet Jackson during the halftime show of the Super Bowl that year. Um, so I guess it would have been in 2005, 2004, I don't remember, but that year. And those were video clips that people were interested in for obvious reasons. And so they created a way to easily share videos through the internet that became YouTube. And of course, the other thing that everyone shared back then was funny cat videos, and that hasn't really changed a whole lot. So that's, you know, that kind of an idea starts a company like YouTube, which is worth, you know, billions of dollars at this point. So he's the chief technology officer. He's named one of the top 50, quote, people who matter now in business. And he was named one of the top 15 Asian scientists to watch in 2011. And he was given the Order of Lincoln which is the highest honor the state can give by the state of Illinois in 2018 for his contributions to technology. So, I mean, you know, this, this idea of, you know, Asian Pacific Americans and the influence, of course, it's not going away. It's only getting bigger as, as the population grows, uh, grew about 1%, you know, from about 5% to 6% between 2010 and 2019 total population of, people who claim Asian descent, um, that's going to grow too. And, and of course, Chen's not done. He sold, you know, his portion of YouTube to others, I guess, Google. And he's founded other companies, as these guys always do, Avos Systems, Nom.com, Mixbit, which is a, some of you may be using Mixbit. I don't know. It's a video sharing app that competes with Instagram and Vine. So, you know, again, this guy's still alive. You know, sometimes in history, what you end up doing most of the time is talking about dead people, old dead people, and people don't get it. And I understand that. But there's a lot of people that are alive today who are doing great things. So let's go back. Let's go to the next slide, if you would. Uh, we're almost there. So the Pacific. Yeah, is there a map back up one? Go back to that map. Nope. Okay. Well, that's fine. I want you to think about the Pacific. I must have sent you the old version that didn't have that saved. The Pacific is that huge area. We're going to look at these people here in just a second. The Pacific's this huge area, right? As we saw early on, this this gigantic. It's the biggest ocean in the world. There's more land around it than around any anywhere else. There's more people around it than around anywhere else. You know over you know a couple billion people probably close to it or more that that are that are considered to be part of that asian pacific islander heritage because it encompasses china india japan uh you know all the islands again anytime you list somebody you leave a lot out but that's dozens maybe hundreds of different cultures and languages that are represented there and, and those same people, those same cultures, those same languages are also, of course, represented here in the United States. 
And while, you know, officially our contact with these people goes back, you know, to 1587, you know, it goes well back before that. But really, it's, it's the 1840s when that kind of contact really takes off. You know, the United States obtains California after the Mexican-American War in 1848. That now gives us access to Asia. One of the reasons why they wanted to do that. Uh, you know, 25 years later, 30 years later, we'll build the Transcontinental Railroad. But that's when it really, really picks up this kind of contact. So what you see on the screen here is what I did is I just did a search for, you know, Asian descended American celebrities just to see who would come up. And a lot of these shocked me because I didn't know. Some it's obvious, some it's not. But I, not all of these people are pictured here. But Naomi Campbell is a supermodel. Dean Kane is an actor. A lot of actors and singers on this list um, and they're kind of mixed up in there but if, if you look at some of these folks you might think well, no there, there's no asian kind of characteristic in there but a lot of them do their parents so uh, comes from that region uh, vanessa hudgens is another actress neo is a singer and an actor keanu reeves kirk hammett guitar player for metallica uh, Nicole Scherzinger, Enrique Iglesias. I know he's known as this great Latin singer, but uh, he's part Filipino. And if if you know your history at all, of course, the Philippines were controlled by Spain for a long time. And so there's a, there's a big kind of mixture going on there uh, before they came under U.S. control. Um, Kristen Crook is an actress. She's been in two or three different series. Tiger Woods has Asian... Um, Ancestry, Nora Jones, the singer, Chrissy Teigen, Constance Wu, another actress, Tyson Beckford, a model. He modeled for Polo, uh, Jean Aiko, Chanel Iman, Harry Shum Jr., Bruno Mars, another very popular singer, Lucy Liu, of course, and Randall Park, another uh, comedian and actor. If you watched WandaVision, you saw Randall Park. He was one of the FBI agents. So uh, as we wrap this up, just you know, think about how big the area is, how many people have come to this region, to the United States from this region. But think about this, the United States is younger than almost all of those nations where the people were you know, feeding from. China's thousands of years old. The United States is about 250 years old. Right. If you want to go back to colonial times, maybe 400 years old, you know, Japan's ancient by comparison and Korea. And, and of course, they have their own histories, their own stories and their own um, backgrounds that would be worth looking at, too. We just, again, like my class, barely skipped the surface, barely skimmed just a handful of people and individuals that had some kind of impact on American history. So I'm finished with the presentation. If you want to close that down and I'm ready for questions, I guess if anyone has any questions, I know we got off to a rough start because of the technology and whatever, but we're here and ready <laughs> to, uh, to entertain you if we can. Well, we don't have a question on Facebook, but we did have a comment from Ketty Ket. He said, hi, I'm following you from Italy. So he just wanted All right. you to know that he's watching from way over there. Good deal. That was pretty cool. What time is it in Italy? No idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have a question. Um, you know, you as you said in the beginning of uh, your presentation, that we don't have a lot of time for specific people in a, a community college. You may find it if you major in a history class. Um, history is vast. Uh, I mean, just these people that you brought to us today, I've never heard of some of these people. And yet the significance that they have in our American history, um, it, it's almost a a, sh a crime that we are not learning about them. Do you see any change in that or, or like who decides who's more important? Um, you know, and now is we're focusing more on diversity. 
Do you think that's going to change? Well, some of that's up to the big wigs, you know, that decide curriculums, but some of it is up to the instructors themselves. We have a lot of leeway, but we're still beholden to kind of this timeline. But I do suspect that, you know, there'll be more care paid, I'd certainly by me, to at least highlight people. The challenge is you could literally look at this with any and every group. You name the group, there's too many people to really talk about. But I, I suspect going forward, there'll be a little more care paid, you know, at the uh, academic level as they're creating these master courses to to try to include some of this. But in, in community college, there's just no way. You could say, well, we could have some other classes and they do. You know, we have a Texas history class and a African-American history class, but those rarely happen, at least on Fort Hood. And part of the reason is, they already have these other classes that they have to take, you know, US history, Western civilization are pretty common. Um, and so that's why at this level, you don't do that. And so you really do have to go to the next level to get those to get those courses. So I, you know, there it, it is already there. It's it's in go to Sam Houston State, go to you know uh, Texas A&M Central Texas here and, and you'll find them. Obviously, not everyone. They can only offer so many classes, but you'll find them. But but your best bet really is to read, read books, go to the library. Again, look at Wikipedia, read the article, go down to the bottom and look at some of the source material and pick some of those books up. And that'll give you a much, much better feel for what's going on. It's great to have a teacher who can help explain things. But like I said, it's a, it literally we're hopping through just even American history, which isn't that long. Imagine how hard it is to do Western civilization, which is 4,000 years. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I see it and, and, you know, I agree there's, there's information out there. Um, so a lot of this, we may have to go ahead and reach out on our own. So thank you for that. Thank you. Lee, any any other questions? Um, hi in Italy. No, there are no questions at this time. Okay. All right. Well, um, uh, Professor Walls, uh, if anyone would like to contact you uh, to get maybe some more information, would that be okay um, if, if sure. they went ahead? And we can go ahead and um, if you don't mind putting your email in the chat, and that way, Lee can go ahead and put it in the comments. Um, or you can look on our directory and you'll be able to find him. He is hard to find. It took me months to find him. We're <laughs> suggestion. On Call Fort the Hood. office administrator over at Fort Hood. She really can oh. find him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they're used to tracking us down. We have to be flexible over there. You know, we move yeah. around a lot. And of course, with COVID <laughs> over the last year, it's been wild. Right, right. Well, thank you everyone for being so patient. Um, we, we always have to occasionally have some kind of a technical problem. It wouldn't be virtual if we did. That's correct. Um, we, we have something very special tomorrow at noon. We have our Byways finalists, our reception. It will be virtual. We will have our writers and our authors. Um, so we'll probably be doing a lot of in and out, lo losing uh, internet here, there, and everywhere. But they are all ready to visit with you, talk about their work. And so we hope that you will be able to join us tomorrow at noon, the same place. And um, we want to just thank you guys for hanging in there and to continuing to follow our virtual events. Uh, Professor Walls, thank you so much. I know it was long time coming, but we we got it. Well, we'll have to come back and do it again. That sounds great. And we'll have a different area of history. So they, eventually we can have all of the American history. Right. In about 100 years, we'll get there. Oh, well, I don't think I can last that long. So. All right, well, thank you so much. And Lee, if you will take us out, we will everybody enjoy the rest of your day. The weather is beautiful today. So go outside. Have a good one.